topics and opinions expressed in the following show are solely those of the hosts and their guests and not those of W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. We make no recommendations or endorsements for radio show programs, services, or products mentioned on air or on our web. No liability, explicit or implied, shall be extended to W4CY Radio or its employees or affiliates. Any questions or comments should be directed to those show hosts. Thank you for choosing W4CY Radio. Welcome to the Camping Show. This is C.W. Getz. It is Wednesday, May 12th, 2021. I got a couple of quick announcements I need to make here. Uh, we discovered we had a problem with our website, which I'm happy to announce. Uh, for those people that were wanting to order T-shirts and uh, hoodies, uh, it is temporarily not functional. Um, so if you want to order them, you know what you want, um, you can email me and I'll get back to you and we will get that taken care of for you. The email address to use is cwgetsoutdoors at yahoo.com. Thank you for that, Roxy. Uh, a couple other things. Um, I am going to be hosting a tent camping clinic on May 22nd. Now, this is for the local the local people here where I live. Uh, May 22nd, 1 o'clock p.m. at Pulaski Park in LaSalle, Illinois. Again, that's May 22nd, Saturday, May 22nd, 1 p.m. Pulaski Park in LaSalle, Illinois. Uh, we will be selling T-shirts there and hoodies. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, uh, tents, how to tell a, a well-designed tent from a, a poorly designed tent. We're going to be talking about sleeping bags, sleeping mats, cooking over a fire, um, processing firewood, and uh, actually rain tarps too, and then storm rigging, So, and a host of other things. So hope everybody that uh, lives in the area can make it down for that. Um Another thing is we're going to be recording a video. My friend, Chef Tisha Taylor and I, Dehydrating for Adventuring is what it's going to be called. We're going to be recording that on the 28th of May. And I would assume that probably two weeks, uh, we get that thing edited, it'll be up and out. And then she is going to be on the show. I think the following week we're going to be talking about that uh, that video and some alternatives to the meat products that will be showing on that video dehydrating so um anyway we have got a great show here for you this evening uh tonight's episode is discovering a personal calling with our special guest alex savati and uh, a little bit about alex adventure guides alex savati and his brother 31 year old aaron savati have owned and operated an outfitting business and store in Ontario, Canada for the past several years. The two brothers also host a free online workshop on Wednesday nights. Other projects in the works include an upcoming mini documentary and a new book titled The Tripper's Handbook. The brothers will also be hosting several in-person learn to camp workshops this summer. Well, with that, welcome to the show, Alex. Thank you, CW, happy to be here. How are you doing? I'm doing well. We were it's just talking about the weather. weather. Yeah, I was your, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> what were you no. saying? Yeah. <laughs> the sun. It's a bit. It's been a warm day, and we've had some pretty chilly ones for the past couple of weeks. So it was yeah. nice to spend a lot of time outside. Yeah, good for you. Yeah, we were just talking about that before the show. You, uh, you need some rain up there. We'll send you ours. We had plenty this past weekend, and I said, now you know we can do just about anything down here. Now. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> yeah, don't ask what that's about, but absolutely. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm glad to hear you're doing well and you're getting some good weather up there. Yeah. Um, let me ask you this to start off with, what does the term personal calling from an outdoors adventure aspect actually refer to? That's a great question. Um, I, I'd say the short answer for that is the thing that you do that has you feeling the most like yourself, the most alive, the most lit up. Um, and I'll give a bit of context for that. You know, a couple of years ago in the off season when I'm not guiding, I work at a forest school here in Guelph. And I had this idea to write a children's book for the school called A Hole in the Fence. And the whole premise of this book was there was this little fox who worked in a big city and a big building and a big bank and would rush off to work every day and she would scamper past this, past this fence. And every time she walked past the fence, she noticed a hole in the fence. And one day she walked by and she heard 
like yips and yees and howls coming through. And the other day she walked by and she heard laughter and music and, and she's always in this big rush. It's always static going on in her life. And one day she's walking by the hole in the fence and she sees in the mud a track that looks res- remarkably like her own foot. Oh, wow. And she has this like moment of, oh my God, like what, what do I do? And of course she pokes her head through the fence and beyond the fence is the quote unquote wild. It is, you know, the space where she meets all the wild animals and coyotes and wolves and foxes and every pe- like all these creatures that rewild her, bring her back to a part of herself that she had, I guess it had drowned out inside of the context of the big city life and all the noise. Okay. And so when we talk about a personal calling, that's, you know, the thing that's calling us that, that place where there's music coming in our lives that, you know, if we just pull the thread a little bit, there is something there that is, I think, inherently related to what has us feeling most alive. Yeah. It sounds very familiar. I mean, I think a lot of us can, can relate to with the story you just told there. So, yeah. Um, and, and unfortunately, you know, it's, um, it, it, yeah, it, it's very common, you know, mm-hmm. very common, I would say. Uh, well, let me ask you this. Is this personal calling that you're referring to from your own experience or maybe more in observation? I'd say a bit of both, and I'll speak to my own experience. Um, you know, I, I did my schooling. I got my master's degree in anthropology, and I had this vision from a young age to go and be this like world traveler and anthropologist and write stories. And that's still very much something that excites me. Um, but when we use again, that context of hole in the fence inside of guiding inside of being in service to, um, being something for people that helps them show the way that offers joy and safety and all these things for me, there, all the other noise it is, it drowns out. Like there is the space inside yeah. of that for me that when I say personal calling, that's, me in the guiding and the outdoor adventure guiding space is me at my absolute best. And so for me, walking through that hole in the fence was starting trip shed was sort of putting the stake in the ground to do this as a means of making my living. And as you know, the thing that I do year round, even at the forest school, like that's, that's it. Yeah. Uh, You know, I mean, did you see the same situation happening with, with other people? I mean, and if you did, I mean, was that what motivated you to, really explore this concept so that you could help others discover their personal calling as well? Yeah. You know, it, it, on the trip, whenever I got a trip, there's always something I say at the beginning of the trip, as soon as we head off from shore and I'll stop the boats and look back on shore for a moment and I'll invite people to try on the context for a moment that a canoe trip is both. It's two things. It's one, it's a going away. You're leaving all that static. You're leaving all that noise. You're leaving the schedule and the work job and the calls and this and that. And it's also very much a coming home. I think there's something inherently in our human experience that knows how to be in nature, that, you know, there's a familiar feeling of dirt beneath our feet without a shoe on. Sure. Absolutely. We we know what wind feels like on our skin without ever having experienced it. And when we can put ourselves in a place like that, where that's all encompassing, where there's no phone, where there's no schedule, where there's no meeting to get to, the only place to get to is where you're at. I think that is a space in which people, end up naturally having that noise drift away. And so seeing them just come alive in a way that maybe they don't often experience, that I think is the first step to creating the space in which a personal calling in which, you know, you can really hear clearly that music and noise in your life. And I've seen it with people that have come out of a trip being like, oh my God, like yeah, this huge revelation. Like, and it doesn't like, you know, it doesn't need to be forced. That's the thing. There's never, you don't have to sit down. Okay. Like, revelation time everyone around the right. fire like, we're gonna find the thing it's not it just happens organically sure. in some way or another it could be after a big storm or after around the fire flow and wherever it is but there's something about the setting where yeah where your hand is forced in terms of having the static taken away that makes way for something else to show up you know isn't it funny how storms actually do something to you isn't that weird yeah I, I remember talking, you know, I I don't know what trip it was, but we, we all sat around. And, uh, of course, we had a few beers in us, but uh, we were talking about this, you know, the storm and the whole story. And everybody's everybody's mood, first of all, changed. Mm-hmm. But but it was it it kind of and I don't really know if I can describe this uh, properly, but it sort of created this little bit of a unified sort of feeling amongst everybody there yeah. you know it's kind of like okay now it's us against the storm but it, it's like you're saying it's you you're really in touch with what's going on out there in, in well I'll, I'll give you one more story to that i remember what in my early guiding career and i think this was I, seeing this clicked something for me and it's just coming back to mind now 
I was guiding a group of 13-year-olds uh, in an Algonquin Park trip, and we hit like the mother of all storms, big waves, boats, tent, like just Ooh. an absolute gong show. Nice. And I remember standing at the end of a portage as lightning was bolting down and maybe there was hail. Like it was just, it was calamity. And I remember in that moment as a guy to be like, I can either freak it because I'm <clears throat> at that age too. And I still am. There's an excitement and almost a, a bit of fear around really intense weather when you're that vulnerable. And I had this moment of, I can either like kind of tense up and what do we do here? Or I can just like start singing and laughing like an absolute idiot to the point that it is so jarring for kids because they were all crying and afraid. Oh, wow. And after the trip or after that summer, one of the campers had sent me a video of me like in my life jacket, in a raincoat at the edge of a lake with a canoe on my shoulders, doing the Macarena, like something, <laughs> just yelling and being an absolute idiot. And that for me is like, that's the hole in the fence. That is the space that I'm in where something else takes over. And, you know, I think that's great. And and yeah. I, I have to say, I, I can only imagine that when they see someone doing something, like, especially, if, especially if you're a guide, and that's going to change the mood. I mean, now all of a sudden, totally. it's sort of like humor overrides fear in many yeah. cases. Not all. I understand. But, uh, but. Yeah, I'm sure that was very effective. Did you? Well, did you and find I think that's that? the role of guides <clears throat> altogether in this space is that nature at its like, especially on a canoe trip where there's no accessible sort of helpline, um, there's a lot of uncertainty and there's a lot of things that can come up that are that are nerve wracking and, and sort of throw a wrench into the like the picture perfect sunset because sure. nature doesn't really care about how you feel about <laughs> like it's just it's doing doesn't what know, it's doing. doesn't it's, care it's what it's there to do <laughs> right and the, I think the role is of the guide to be that like very grounded presence that can turn something to can turn circumstances that at face value seem quote unquote bad into like a really loving beautiful exciting moment. And I, that to bring that back to the to the hole in the fence, personal calling, the circumstances of everyday life are always there's always a storm somewhere. You, you know, it doesn't take long to figure out something is a problem. I got to do this. I got to do that. And we get all anxious in our heads about it. And the thing that's on the other side of the fence typically is that calm, grounded presence is the thing that you do that has you relaxed, has you in, in your own skin. Yeah, center exactly. Even keeled, totally. You know, I can only imagine too that uh, when your guide does something like that and it and it turns the mood, you know, for the better, that that's something you're going to take away with, uh, take away from that, mm -hmm. and, and take with you and keep with you for a long time. Am I right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so y my next question here is is tell us about how you're utilizing backcountry adventuring to help uh, people discover a better alternative to the stress of typical everyday life as we know it. But I think you kind of just answered that. Uh, just you know. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it is the, I can think of no better setting in which all the noise is drowned out. And especially today, especially these days, there's, you know, how accessible is, is chaos right in our hand. Whenever you want it, there is, there's chaos ready to go. And not even in the broad scale of the world, but every like just coming down the pipes on a daily basis of, of things we have to deal with and places we have to be and and think places we can't be. Like there's so much, um, there's so much vying for our attention. Yeah, and that pulls us away from that even keel space. And on a canoe trip, in outdoor adventure, where you're, the presence of what's around you is cast upon you in such a way that. There's no room for static. There's no room to give thought to what's back at home. There's no room to give thought to what's happening across the world because you have no access to it. That's true. That's yeah. very true. Yeah. And I, I, you know, when you go on trips, I mean, it's, it, it takes probably a day, you know, I would say a good yeah. solid day. And all of a sudden now my whole, you know, Hey, I forgot about everything that's going on back there and mm -hmm. I'm enjoying what's in front of me. And it, it yeah. should be like, uh, Alex, you're 28, am I right? I, I just read that somewhere, and I, I forgot. Right, that's because <laughs> yeah, I'm 28. Uh, when, when did uh, I'm going to ask you this? When did, um, when did this happen for you that you you know you said you know something, um, this this whole rat race, you know, everyday rat races, and and I, w when did you discover your personal calling? Um. I don't mean like were you driving your car down interstate mm -hmm. so and so. I mean like about what age that were you know were you? Yeah, I think I was about. Uh, I must have been nineteen or twenty, and I was I was on a trip. Um, 
and without taking a ton of time to go into the every detail of the story, uh, I was paddling a river with a friend of mine and, you know, the long story short is that we accidentally paddled our boat over like a five meter waterfall. And it was very much a near. Okay. okay. You're not, you're, you're, you're not going to go away with giving that a short story. We're going to have to have some details on this because it sounds very good. Let's hear, okay. the, let's hear the story for sure. So at the time I was like, guiding was like a very fun thing to do. And, mm -hmm. um, on this trip, I was traveling with a friend of mine who he is like the guy you have in your life who gives you that look that says like, let's go do this thing. And we were traveling the Petawawa River up in uh, Northern Algonquin Park. And every guidebook that we had for this trip, you know, said, don't paddle this rapid, paddle this rapid. You can do this if you're this, you can do that. And everything that we saw, like there was this three kilometer stretch of rapids. And we said from the very beginning of the trip, we're not gonna paddle these rapids. We, I, I have done two trips in my life of whitewater. I have no whitewater experience to actually like know what to do. Okay. And we're at the beginning of this 3K portage. We've anticipated the whole trip. And all of a sudden, before we like get out of the boat to start carrying it, my friend Matt gives me this look. And it's the look that I've seen time and time again of like, <laughs> he nods at me and nods at the boat and nods at the river and nods back at me and back at the boat and back at the river. Oh boy. And within minutes, we were in the boat, and it was kind of like he, he – I remember vividly him saying from the back of the boat, um, you know, you, me, and Algonquin is, like, not the worst way to go. And <laughs> I, like, nervous laughter agreed, and I said, yeah, you know, you're right. And we paddled, paddled, and paddled, and our first rapid we hit was, like, maybe two, three feet, and the boat tipped, and it was like, oh, my gosh. Because, um, yeah. again, I, get, I had only ever done, like, little nothing swift, little, like, whoop, kind of yeah. rivers. <laughs> and – and when you say tip, do you, do you mean you dumped it? We dumped the first one, yeah. You dumped it, okay. And this is like 80 meters into the stretch of three kilometer rapids. Okay. And so we like, okay, maybe we should take this seriously. And we flipped the boat back over and we tied our shoes on and like hooked all. We had no paddling gear. We had no helmets, no. Oh, as wow. far as, you know, a young, stupid decision to make, this is right up there. Unfortunately, and that's very paddling, common. <laughs> very yeah, common. exactly. <laughs> and... They, we paddled and paddled and paddled and, you know, a couple more drops, a couple more swifts and we were like doing okay. And all of a sudden we turn a bend and up ahead in the distance, all I saw in front of me was this very thin line of white. And I was sitting in the stern of the boat at this time. And so I stand up quickly to try and get a better scout of this rapid. And all I see behind this line of white are the tops of trees. And I can remember to this day, the feeling of my feet, of my heart hitting my toenails. <laughs> uh, and I yelled to Matt, like, Matt, we should probably pull over and scout this out. He said, yeah, yeah, for sure. That sounds good. And the river is going quicker and we're getting closer. And as we try and pull over to scout out this river, the boat gets turned around backwards. Oh, so now we're facing upstream. <laughs> and in an instant, you know, we both, without saying a word, jump up in our seats and spin around. So now I'm at the front of the boat. Matt's at the back. And, you know, typically in white water, I think, I mean, I, again, I, I have no idea, but I think people... The person in the front of the boat yells out, you know, rock left, rock right, you know, what directions to make. Mm -hmm. And all I remember vividly as the boat starts to hit this line of white is Matt yelling, just hold on, top of his lungs. And I slam my paddle down on the gunnels and I grip the gunnels for dear life. <laughs> and I remember, I don't know what the time actually was, may have been a minute, a second or an hour, but the boat went vertical. And I could feel the back of the boat against my back. I could feel Matt splashing into my shoulders. And... Wow. In an instant, we all of a sudden hit the water, and I was eye level with the river as we came belly back up. And somehow came like you know unscathed as far as what should have happened because yeah. as the boat buoyed back up and we pulled over to an eddy, we look behind us, and there is this five meter waterfall that fell into this like pit of rocks. And the only spot that we the spot that we hit was the only spot that you could hit that would not have eaten. You alive. didn't. Oh my god! Yeah, you're lucky. Laughing as if this river is looking at us, yelling at us for just escaping its clutches. Wow. And, and this was 500 meters into the set of rapids. And so yeah. he's like, we got to get back in the boat. Like we, we have no, we, and I'm just like crying, laughing, shaking. And we just in the boat, let's go. And we paddle some more, paddle some more. And thinking we are invincible, we turn another corner. And this time, not a line of white, but what we see in front of us, which I later found out was actually a, a sluice. So back in the logging days, they would dam it up. Oh yeah. Essentially a long hallway of chaos rock, you know, death and carnage of just like zigzag boulder, zigzag boulder, all white, all water, no shoreline. And again, hard to my toenails. And I said, Matt, we got to pull over and scout this out. And he says, yeah, 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 for sure. So luckily we were able to find a small crack in the rocks to scout this out. And 
you know, I stood there holding the boat, half one foot in the water, one foot on the on the edge of the cliff while Matt ran up ahead to check out the river. And he comes back 30 seconds, 10 minutes later. And I was like, well, how does it look? He said, I pretty much the same. Get in the boat. Let's go. Oh, boy. And what ensued, we both, you know, in a moment, just jumped forward into the boat, kind of Superman dive. And we just like, that was it. You were in it. And what followed was 10 minutes of by far the best paddling I have ever done in my life. Probably wow. anybody's like, it was the most flawless. Every single turn, every curve was impeccable until such time that I remember vividly having a thought of like, wow, we're actually doing this really well. And the second I had that thought, the boat tipped and all of a sudden, then came the chaos and the boat was being swung forward. Matt, I hear Matt yelling, just keep your feet forward. I'm getting thrashed apart by rocks. I remember having this image of the map flying from one wave crest to another and sticking my hand out and grabbing the map. We're getting tossed around. Packs are being like, it was just an absolute disaster. Hallway yeah. of disaster, yeah. <laughs> and eventually we eddied out and it just like ended like that and it was all calm. And then we got back in the boat, had a big laugh, had a big cry, had a big whatever, and, and paddled the rest of the river. And we were fine after that. Yeah. And what this story gave me is like to bring it back to your question of personal sure. calling. This was the first instance in my life that I had ever experienced um, complete presence. There was no space for anything else to show up in that stretch of river where we paddled flawlessly. Yeah. There were no there was not a single thought that I had until such time that I had a thought and everything went awry. You were there and that's it was the completely only there. And I was and you know, we people talk about being in flow where everything you do is perfect. Yeah. And that for me was like a oh my gosh moment. And the waterfall prior to that, where we almost lost their life. Yeah. Um I got how transient I everything was. And after that trip, we kind of came back and we got to our site that night. And I remember it's just thinking like you know, life is short and yes, it is. I want to do what I want to do and I want to enjoy and I want to, you know, feel like I'm at my edge and feel like I'm offering something to people through the level of presence that can be achieved. Ideally not by getting thrown down a hallway of disaster, but yeah, by pushing your edge and by being in a space where their noise is naturally canceled out. That's, that's extremely cool. And, and thank you for sharing that story, by the way. And, and, and I, I'm definitely glad we heard that because, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I think the rest of this is going to mean a lot more having known what you uh, what you experienced there. But uh, right now, um, we're gonna we're gonna pause. Uh, we're gonna take a little break, uh, but sure. don't go away. We'll be right back with more of the camping show on W Four CY Radio and Talk Four TV right after these messages. It is time to go camping. Introducing Campground View's virtual tours. You can tour the campground, see the sites, see if they are available, and click to book your perfect spot. Hit the open road and explore the amazing places found in nature. We make it easy to discover, find, and book your site so that you can go have the fun and freedom you seek. Campground View's virtual tours make it easy and simple for you to see where you are going. And we're back with our guest, Alex Savati, here on The Camping Show. Uh, Alex, someone asked you specifically what things, what type of things are you teaching at the trip shed uh, mm. on your trips and, and in your workshops? Yeah. Um, so this year we're doing uh, trips a bit differently. In the past, I think the guiding industry is often, it's a point A to point B guide. The guide shows up. There's natural teaching and education that happens. But the role is very much of getting you from one spot to another safely, building your fire, carrying the gear you don't want to carry. Yeah. And what we're trying to do this year is to use a canoe trip as a medium for something else. So we have what we're calling wilderness workshops and they're three day trips that are focused on teaching certain content. Most of which that we're doing this year are the backcountry beginner. And on those trips we're teaching, 
they're very short distance trips. They're not long days. They're not grueling, you know, canoe trip experiences, but they're designed so that there is time and space at each step of what you have to do on a trip to teach it. Okay. So there's a, a paddling lesson at the beginning. There's a navigating lake, a navigating lesson on the lake, how to carry a boat, how to lift a boat on your own, how to build a fire, how to cook over a fire, how to set up a campsite, what to look for, how to handle things that might come up, all built on the pretense that somebody will come on our trip once and mm -hmm. after that be able to trip on their own. Like our so, perfect so, customer is one that we don't see again. Yeah. So they're getting some basic, basic knowledge. You're getting some like a kind of like a crash course. In other words, we're getting, yeah. All, yeah. Yeah. And then we're doing other ones as well. We have two other ones running this year. Um, a backcountry botany trip where we've got a local ecologist who's like, you know, the guy to know as far as Algonquin plant life goes. And that oh, trip wow. again is focused on teaching, um, plant ecology, ID, botany on a canoe trip. So it's, you get the kind of the best of both worlds of learning and having this beautiful trip. And then another one where we're doing birding. So we've got an like a, a friend of mine, an ornithologist is coming in and teaching about birding, about migration patterns in the place where you can see it live. Those sound like very, very interesting trips. I think that's very cool. Now, let me ask you a question on the birding yeah. trip. Yeah. Do people get to bring their cameras and-, and For sure. And bring bring yeah. 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 Absolutely. That's very cool. Um, yeah. And, and so you're talking about short distances, like what kind of distance are we talking about? Uh, so uh, to put it in time length, um, I would say, you know, no longer than a six to seven hour day as far as travel, mm -hmm. but typically, you know, not big lakes, portages, not over a kilometer and a half at the most. Okay. Um, because especially for folks that are trying out tripping for the first time, I know I've had guiding experience starting at 16 and, you know, every trip that you can imagine from long portages at like five, six, seven kilometers that you just right. hate. Yeah, absolutely. And somebody who's trying to get into it, I don't think there's a ton of value in like, here's the grueling, like, you know, eat dirt. And I would agree. <laughs> here's the box. To do. <laughs> I would like, agree. You want to try and make it approachable and accessible so that yeah. folks can get out there and do it on their own and then have the grueling experience whenever it shows up because usually it's not on cue, but it is right on cue. Yeah. And yeah. and so how far are they paddling too, by the way? Um, as far as paddling, maybe mm -hmm. 10, 15 kilometers a day of paddling. Seems like a pretty good trip. I mean, a, a nice trip. Yeah. And, and each one of those are about the same distance, same length, yeah. or do they vary actually? The, the backcountry beginners are all about the same length. A lot of them are the same route. Mm -hmm. uh, the birding one is, is designed to get into spots where there's migratory patterns happening, especially the same thing with the uh, botany trip. So it's the route is planned. It's a bit of a longer day on the botany trip, but we're yeah. getting to a spot where we spend two nights at the same site and then have the day to really dig into the plant life and, and the ecology happening on that area. Yeah, that's extremely cool. I like that. Yeah. Um, let me ask you a question. This, and this goes back to sort of about your story that you just told. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but maybe not. Um, when, when people go on these trips, you know, what kind of feedback uh, have you received from people who've uh, attended your, well, first of all, your workshops and uh, and and the trips? Um, can you share some stories with us uh, about those, that feedback? Yeah, you know, I, I think people are often surprised. There, there's, of course, like the beautiful views that people see and that, that comes to the territory quite literally. Sure. Um, but there's two things that come to mind. One, people surprise themselves at their own capacity. I think people, especially human, like humans, don't really. If somebody lives in a lives in a home and goes and drives to work and sits in an office, like they don't actually get a chance to test their capacity very often. And on a trip, when you're carrying a boat for a kilometer, there's a good opportunity there to test it. If you're paddling against the headwind for six hours, like you, there is opportunity to meet a part of yourself that often lies dormant. Yeah. So they, that often gets shared as like, I didn't know I could do that. Right. <clears throat> and I found that experience, especially as a younger guide, you know, I used to guide in an overnight camp and I, it would take boys and girls trips out separately. And I always found the young boys would come onto the trip being like, I can do whatever I carry it all, no problem. And 10 meters into the portage, they're like, I can't do anything. <laughs> and young girls would always show up being like, I, don't, I mean, I'll give it a shot. I'll see. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll try my best. Yeah. And they would just like walk the entire portage, no problem at all. Wow. So people surprise themselves a lot on trips, and that's often feedback we get is, oh, my God, I didn't know I could do that. And there's also what I said before, of right on cue and not on cue at all. There seems to always be a moment. I, one example is coming to mind of a trip I guided two years ago, and there was a pouring rain day. It was a group of folks from a day camp, and it was a, a, a bit of a grueling day, a long paddle. And just by happenstance at the evening, like we had just finished dinner, 
and we all sat down to like have our out breath of the day and the skies cleared up and like two or three 25 rainbows showed up all at once and at the site we were on you know there was a fire pit on a rocky outcropping on the lake separate of the inside campsite fire pit and so i like in an instant grabbed some wood brought a fire pit brought made a fire out by the lake and we all ended up sitting out there for you know three four hours roasting marshmallows up the oh, edge wow. of the lake and having this really, really impactful, beautiful conversation about our own capacity as humans and about why we're here and about, you know, what we want to do and about our holes in the fence. And those kind of conversations are very difficult to force. And oh, yeah. there, there is, when I say, again, right on cue and not on cue at all, is that it happens. And I think that's the role of the guide is to be present to what is being called for in that moment. And in that instant, I knew like, all right, like we've got to go have a fire and sit by the lake. Like, this yeah. is perfect. And to capitalize on perfection when it occurs, because it, it who knows when it's going to occur. Exactly. It's spontaneous. And yeah, and, you know, yeah, you can't plan stuff like that. And after the trip that like, you know, they all shared that that was the highlight of their trip was like the rainbow lakeside fire party. Yeah. Well, you know, that just kind of leads me into my next question. I mean, what sort of things do people that, that do these trips seem to enjoy the most about them? You know, and, um, is, there any, is there any one or two things you say everybody food. loves this and everybody the food. <laughs> oh the food yeah i mean I no, think the food. You, you enjoy things so much more on a trip because of how stripped away everything is like people always share like every meal you make on a trip is always this is the best meal i've ever had in my life you could be making mac and cheese with hot dogs but they've worked all day they're in the book like they're um the value of comfort on a trip is brought up a million and 10% because of the context in which it's happening. Okay. So people always share, yeah, they love the food. Um, yeah, I think they just, they, they love the feeling of accomplishment. They love the sense that they are strong. They love feeling strong and that they can do something. Yeah. You know, I was just, I, I'm looking on my phone here. Uh, you had, I think it was you that had a post this afternoon. It was, maybe it was your brother. Um, maybe it was a trip shit. I'm not sure, but it was something about sweet potato. Uh, what was that? Tell me about so this. this. Is a, my brother and I made this <laughs> by mistake, and it was the best mistake ever on a trip years ago. And it was we slow baked sweet potatoes in the fire, wrapped in foil for like three hours, so that when they came out, they were like liquid. Oh wow! And we had a tomato. So my so my my brother and I are Italian, so we grew up with like a dad who had hey, a ragu, on, ragu on the stove every Sunday, cooking for eight hours. And so we would often have on these longer trips, have a site, have a, have two nights on the same site. So you had the whole day to just relax, sleep in, make a long mix. So we had ragu cooking all afternoon, took the sweet potato out of the, out of the fire, mashed it with brie cheese, stirred that into the sauce, um, white wine. I forget, like just all this whole concoction of stuff in there, sliced up, sauteed, caramelized salami wow. that cooked for a while. And then my dad always made this dish called pasta al forno, which is, kind of a play on lasagna, but you layer penne pasta, um, ragu or tomato sauce, cheese, and you just layer that. And then you bake it off in the oven and you broil it at the ends. So the top gets crispy. So we did that in a pot, layered all this stuff up, closed the, closed the lid of the pot, threw it in the fire, buried it in the hot coal so that it was essentially an oven. And when it came out, it was this like, I can't even, yeah, words won't do it justice, but yeah. it's what, good. Now what, do you, what do you call that again? Uh, that specific dish there isn't a name the, the sweet potato brie tomato sauce <laughs> mess of love um, but pasta al forno is the uh, is the baked pasta dish okay yeah 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 it sounds very good when i read this i was like wow i mean this yeah. of course it, and the way you described was it you that posted that or was it your brother i posted that yeah you posted that the way yeah. you described it i'm telling you it was like <laughs> oh yeah oh my gosh okay i'm getting hungry I here that. no it was very very good uh so I'm going to ask you this, and, yeah. uh, and by the way, thank you for sharing that with us. Because it, and like uh, Mustang Seven Seven Four, could you pop that up here again, Roxy? Uh, yeah, food always yeah. tastes better in the woods, and it, and it seems to. Why do you think that is, Alex? What is that? Um, is it the smoke? Is it the fire? What is that? It's everything. I, again, I think it's the context in which it's happening. It's coming on the tails of a long day. It's kind of like they're. Actually, it comes back to what I was saying before, that everything else is stripped away. Yeah. How many times do you sit down for dinner with somebody and they're on your phone or it's a TV playing or there's a radio, whatever's happening on a trip, 
let alone the gorgeous sight you have, but there's no distraction. So you can be a lot more present with the food. And if you're already hungry and I've had a big long day and you finally like put in the work to gather the wood for the fire and tend the fire and, and gather the water from the lake to cook the pasta, like it's a very involved present experience to make and eat food in the wilderness. And I think anything that we do, whether it's a meal or a project or a book or a relationship, the more that you spend time tending presently to that thing, the more value it has. Yeah. Yeah. The better okay. it is. And that makes perfect sense. I would, I would definitely agree with that. Yeah. Alex, can you walk us through, I mean, start to finish, um, what do you, like, okay. So what are your most popular guided adventure trips, you know, and explain, you know, what type of itinerary, itinerary rather that they could, uh, they could expect to mm -hmm. uh, one, one of these, most one of the most pop, one of the more popular trips, I should say. Uh, yeah. So typically, you know, we meet at the access point lake at say 10 o'clock on the day and we'll go over some basics of paddling. We'll get to know the group, maybe take some time just to chat and, and see where everyone's coming from, what they, what they're into, what their interests are, just kind of develop a baseline level of rapport. Um, I'll always like to take time going through each pack so that everybody is everybody knows what's happening. Everyone mm -hmm. knows what the gear because you don't have a lot in the backcountry, and ideally everyone is able to do all the things. Um, and that's for you know, the backcountry beginners trip. The intention is to teach everybody how to do all the things. So we'll go over all the packs, go over how to paddle, go over how to read a lake, just to learn to get our bearings on the water, and then we'll usually get on the water. Okay. We might paddle for an hour or two, uh, do a portage, maybe do two. And again, taking time at the portage to sh like, how do you land at a portage? How do you, you know, effectively unload the boat? How do you carry a canoe? What's it like when you're actually carrying the canoe? Taking time. Um, so we'll do a portage or two, maybe another lake or two. And then ideally we get to our site on the first day at about five or six o'clock. Okay. Um, just to give time again for people to land in, to not, you know, come off the heels of a big crazy day, to really just like a sort of a gentle ascension onto the trip experience. The next day up, as early as we can. Um, I'm usually up at sunrise on a trip, but I'd like to give folks the opportunity. Hey, I'd like to be ready with, with coffee for them as they get up. <laughs> we, we take our time in the morning and have breakfast and then on the water, you know, tear down the site. Uh, and again, these are, th there, there's, a, uh, I think, nuance that people would develop for themselves. I think in the tripping industry, everyone says that their way is the right way. And I think that there is no right way. It's the way that works for you. Right. So giving people a chance to actually play with what works best for them. And then, Put yeah. it into practice. Yeah. Um, so then we'll get on the water, have another day, a few lakes, a few portages. Um, ideally, you know, maybe stop midday for lunch and take time during that. You know, when I first started guiding, um, again, often guides have their own tripping style. And the first guide I ever guided with, my mentor, was very by the books. It was like, we got to get this point to this point right now, stop for 10 minutes, no longer like, you know, everything was so, the, the whole like, the, like you're in the military or something. Very, right? yeah, exactly. <laughs> And the next guy that I guided with um, was the exact opposite. And like oh, yeah. the first lake, he was like, ah, oh, let's take a nap halfway through. Let's just have a rest. No problem. We would get to the site and he would take the food barrel and stand by the fire pit, like just scratching his belly and tip over the entire, like, empty out the entire thing and just stand there like, what do you want to make for dinner? Wow. Uh, the most laissez-faire thing in the world. And that for me was just like a, a jarring, you know, ends of the uh, two ends of the extreme. <laughs> And I developed my own style as somewhere in the middle. So I like for lunches to take time during lunch, have a swim at lunch. Hell, take a nap if you want for 20 minutes. Uh, cook lunch, you know, enjoy a warm meal in the middle of the day. And then back on the water, same thing back to our site at about, or back to a different site at 6 or 7 p.m. Set up camp, have dinner. And uh, ideally that second night is really a chance to sink into the, um, softer bits of a trip to the fireside chats to the you know to the whatever whatever you know i i think that's a great point you make uh, that that balance because you have to have some organization some structure yeah. there you know i mean or you won't you won't make any progress you'll just kind of you know whatever mm -hmm. and uh you know most people have some sort of a schedule to deal with but then again yeah. You know who wants to be in the military when you don't have to be you know that, that's the thing right i guess I don't yeah know. you shouldn't say that but i think you know what i mean yeah um and so so yeah that's um so that's pretty much what they can expect in, on one of these trips and then and then when you wind up um you know you come back i mean do you do you kind of meet with people after you get done with the trip or, or do it does everybody just kind of go their own way i i like to um no but definitely take some time and i think something that i didn't say at the beginning but 
Um, I think that there are there is context that can be built and tended to after that is easily missed. Like taking the time to talk about that, you know, going away and coming home idea, or at the end of a trip, taking a chance to check in, see where folks are at, how are you feeling, what did you learn? Like those things are very fresh in the mind right on the heels of the experience. And yeah. if we take a chance to unpack that a bit and just like listen to where they're at and 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 have other people listen to each other. Um, it gives it gives language and life to what's occurred on the trip, yeah. and I think there's a lot of value in taking time after to debrief, and then maybe having a follow up call a couple of days later and just check in, see how they were doing, how sore your shoulders, and that's very yeah. cool. That's yeah. very cool. I think that's a great idea. By the way, get on lots of little reflection on like you know uh, mm -hmm. your trip. I think that's very that's a very great a uh, very good idea. Uh, let me ask you this. Um, and this is kind of a two-parter. I, I threw this next part in. You know, we do these little uh, outlines. Um, how much paddling or camping experience does someone need to have prior to signing up for one of your adventure trips? And here's the, here's the second part, okay? And I can just do this together. Have you ever had anybody there that had never slept in a tent before? Never done anything? I'll do you one better. Okay. We had a person on a trip last year who uh, was a recent immigrant to Canada and had never stepped foot into a forest. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. So the short answer is none. You know, and again, because these trips aren't highly technical, um, they are uh, no experience required. We've okay. had people sit in the boat for the first time, sleep in a tent for the first time, completely. You know, there. This is the space to try those things in a way that's held in a safe container. Yeah, I mean yeah. that's that's good to know. I mean that's very good to know. So so you don't they don't really have to know anything. Uh, no. Okay. Um. Are there any equipment requirements? In other words, um, uh, uh, what do people, you know, people who sign up for, for a trip, what, what do they need to bring other than like their toothbrush, right? That's really it. I mean, their toothbrush, the clothes on their back. And if they have little personal items that they like, folks love to bring a journal sometimes or a headlamp if they want. Um, but what we're trying to do with TripShed is it's like the one-stop shop for uh, the trip experience that you don't have to bring a tent, a sleeping bag, a sleeping pad, everything that we cover at all canoe rental permits. Like it's all you show, all you show up with is the clothes on your back. Yeah. Now do you tell, do you help them out? I mean, I'm sure they're in contact with you. Do you help them out with clothing and go, okay, well, here's the kind of weather that mm -hmm. we're looking at this week. You will, you'll, you might want to bring one of these or yeah. a jacket or whatever you do that. Oh, totally. And I think that's like in, in, in part of the personal mess kit. So we usually have we break down our packing lists for people to come out is mm -hmm. um, as far as clothing, dry and wet. So your dry clothes are clothes that you wear at night and they stay in the dry bag throughout the day. And it's your like sweatpants and your, you know, cozy socks and a sweatshirt and maybe a spare T-shirt or something. Mm -hmm. uh, and then your wet clothes are clothes that might get wet during the day if it happens to pour rain or if you take a dunk or whatever it is. And that's. Or you if know, you go over a falls or something like that. Yeah. Ideally, <laughs> I'm not, not on our trips. <laughs> Excuse me. That's good. That's good to um, know, right? Yeah. But yeah, the wet clothes are like the rain jacket, the rain pants, right. a pair of hiking boots that will inherently get wet. We, we don't do this anymore, but I used to uh, when I was younger and guiding younger kids. Is before the trip even started, I would make them all walk into the water with their shoes on, because your shoes are gonna are bound to get wet. And it's the aversion to getting your shoes wet, I find, especially at like loading and unloading into a portage where people tip or they fall. And so it's like, you're going to get wet during the day. <clears throat> Own it. It's like, just do it now. It. Get yeah, it over do with. It now. <laughs> and I realized that was like kind of masochistic. So we stopped doing that. But um, it I happens. think it's a good idea, though. I like it. I like mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Even though it is a bit like you say, masochistic. But you know what? It, it, you're right. It's it's always mind over matter with those sort of things. It's like, look, get totally. your shoes wet now. Now we don't we get that black right out of the whole picture. Now. Well, that's the thing. Everything on a trip is mind. Like even back to the story from earlier about the the storm and dancing in it. Yeah, everything is mind over matter. The skills that exist on a trip each exist in a vacuum. It's very easy to learn to build a fire. It's very easy to learn to tie a tarp. It's very easy to learn. These things aren't difficult skills. Not, nothing on a trip is inherently difficult. It is the broader context of the trip where they come together. Um, that the meaning is laid on them and that they start to work in tandem with each other. And so, you know, being able to mind over matter it, like to, to hold the presence of mind. And that's what we're really training on trips is yeah. teaching the skills, but also teaching the mental capacity to be able to move through, you know, a wilderness space for multiple days on your own with the only the gear that you brought with you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, real quick here. Um, yeah. cause I, I, we got some pictures we want to show, um, <clears throat> Is there an age requirement? Uh, 
No, typically we say 12 is the like, um, as far, I mean, no, sorry, pre 12, we've got uh, a discount for kids, but okay. other than that, um, that said, most of the, like, the trips that we have this season are all open sign up. So there's seven spots per trip. Anybody can sign up. So if somebody's looking to bring a three or four or five year old, we can do it. But my suggestion would be, let's make some like let's make a custom private trip for them rather than oh, you know, you're, you you're tending to your four year old with you know, a bunch of twenty one year olds that are learning the trip just and for the can, sake of comfortability. And you can do that. You can make a private trip. It's not a problem. It's totally. Like, yeah, that's very yeah, well, cool. that's how we did most of our. This is the first year we're doing these three day workshops. So typically, it's always been custom private trips. You know, if you have when you have people that have never done, and, and I mean, it's like this in the Boundary Waters. You know, uh, if they've never done a trip before, let's just say somebody gets, I don't know, you know, sick, or they just go, "Oh my gosh, I hate this." Have you ever had anything mm -hmm. like that happen? And and what do you, you know, briefly, what do you do? Yes, and you just shift context. I think that's that's the big thing that comes to mind. I is, mean, I think there's a lot of fear that people go, "What if? What if? What yeah, if?" Yeah, totally. You know and so let's address that real quickly and tell them, you know, what if something happens, Alex? What do you, you know? So you I think that's the role of the guide. I think for folks going on their own, there's so much learning that you can do. You know, wilderness first aid, basic skills, survival skills, all critical to know mm -hmm. that you might not ever use on a trip. But when something comes up that will inherently sour an experience, having those skills in your repertoire are what's going to shift. Not even the outcome of what's happening, but your ability to stay present and even keel throughout it. And then as far as a guide, that's I think the, the role of the guide more so than building a fire for folks is being the safe grounded presence for whatever's happening. So if you have people that are having a bad time, you know, I've had a trip last year where I was taking out a bunch of, um, it was a bunch of like between seven and nine year olds. And there was one kid who at eight o'clock, eight year old kid, you know, in the middle of the night woke up screaming and crying because he missed his mom. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Really bad time. Really, really awful experience for him in that moment. And I brought him outside to the shoreline and we sat and looked at the stars for two hours and like maybe for 10 minutes, he was eight, he had to go to sleep. But just shifting the context and that's extremely cool. Placing attention elsewhere and yeah. acknowledging that it's like, it is, it can be scary, you know, really hearing where they're at, really getting what the, what's going on for them. Yeah. And then that's, that's effort. <laughs> That's no, that's extremely good. And it's, and it's very helpful information to know. I think that, that you know, people, people hearing that are going to go, okay, good. There's a plan B. If something goes wrong, my guide, you know, is going to be trained well enough to know, but okay, here's what we need. And here's what yeah. we can do. No, that's awesome. Roxy, um, let's pull some, let's pull some pictures up here and we're going to have you just briefly tell us what we're looking at. Yeah, this was, uh, this is one of our bigger. So we also, in addition to private guided trips, we do, um, Accessible activations. So we've partnered with a couple of brands in the past to really try and make the outdoors as close and accessible for people as possible. Mm -hmm. So this was a group hike we did with Arcteryx and it was out, I believe, at uh, Mount Nemo, a spot in Ontario. And it was just a big, and this is a big group of folks just out for a hike together with my brother and I. You can see us up in the top right corner there. Um, and this was a totally free hike that people could just come on, sign up for. We had some swag giveaways. Um, but just a way to encourage people and give them a space to show up outside without having to do anything outside or show up. Yeah, very cool. Uh, this is on a tri trip with my brother and some friends a few years back, right at the edge of a waterfall. And um, whenever I uh, I've posted this picture and captioned it, just giving a round of applause to the river. And I think this is like a big celebration. <laughs> CW, this is it. This is the past. There this it is. is. Oh my gosh. The one that we made for the first time, the accident, the beautiful accident happened separately, but this is my brother, Aaron, in the act of making the most delicious dish you've ever had in your entire yes. life. See, that's motivation to do these trips right at, right? Oh, yeah. But, but I'm Italian too, so maybe we think see things differently. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's all about the food, man. Uh, another hike from one of our uh, one of our free accessible hikes. This was uh, during COVID, so it was in a time where we were allowed to gather outside, and we were doing a layering workshop. So, yeah. in the shoulder season, focusing on how to dress appropriately for the weather, uh, and then how to play with layers. So, you know what what a difference is in terms of how much energy you're expending. Yeah. Um, this was that trip where we had the big storm rainbow fireside fire pit party or lakeside fire pit party. Um, and this was just me chatting about navigation. So taking time to, you know, the night before the next day, going over to the next day's route, explaining what's coming ahead. So they have an, they have, uh, an idea of what to expect. Yeah. And this is my brother and I, after we had uh, guided a group of 60 kids through the backcountry in Ontario, it was the most logistically pandemonious trip in the world. 
And this was our post trip, you know, breath of fresh air and, and yeah. enjoying some one on one brother time. Very, very cool. Yeah. Well, thank you for explaining that. And uh, lastly, here, where can people find more information about the workshops and guided trips that the Trip Shed, the trip shed offers? Uh, so www.tripshed.ca is where all of our trips are located, as well as registration for those trips. Instagram at the Trip Shed, Facebook, the Trip Shed. Um, everything we do exists primarily on those three avenues. Uh, and then they can reach out to us directly at info at the trip shed .ca and any questions, root ideas, just wanted to chat. We're, uh, we're here for it. Very good. Well, excellent. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you, Alex, for being uh, my guest here on the camping show this evening. It was a pleasure having you here and, uh, and, and good luck with everything this summer trip. Thank you. CW. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate it. it. Well, I hope you'll tune in next for next week's episode, family adventuring American style with special guest Nina and Brian Wilson. Until then, thank you for tuning into the camping show. This is CW Gets reminding you, learn more, do more. See you next week.